So we can start uh, uh, the real topics of the course uh, and we start, start diving into JavaScript. Okay. So we have uh, the first couple of weeks uh, where we start from scratch, from zero, about uh, JavaScript uh, and we'll end uh, in being able to create some. Uh, Asynchronous applications, so I've been able to create objects, uh, structures, uh, and uh, asynchronous functionalities. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start from, okay, this is a cheat sheet uh, where you find the, the link there that uh, gives you a glimpse of all the most of the, of the most popular methods, but of course we are not learning that by heart. So the goal here is learning JavaScript, uh, as you mentioned, as a language. Mm -hmm. So we are not starting from the browser, we are not starting from uh, a web application, but just, uh, okay, there's a new language, let's understand how it works. Hmm? Uh, understanding it, uh, what, that, what, is, what are there, it's um, specific semantic, uh, it's way of doing, way of repre representing information. Um, we will basically uh, wor uh, work with modern JavaScript, uh, and we'll understand in a moment what, what this means. Uh, uh, what is called something uh, ES6, uh, ECMAScript 6, uh, uh, starting from the 2015 lines of uh, updates. Uh, we have an update every year of JavaScript, but the most important, uh, the refoundation of the language came with this version, and then there was just incremental improvement. We will do some of that. But basically, uh, um, we try to, to refer to this version, which is supported everywhere, basically by Node.js, which is our interpreter that we are running on the server side, and all the browsers that also integrate a, a runtime environment uh, um, supporting basically these versions and also the more recent versions. We'll also learn about a mechanism uh, where an older version of the JavaScript interpreter will be able, can be able, to interpret a language uh, with the, um, that uses some code that uses uh, newer features of the language. Thanks to an internal mechanism of uh, rewriting all JavaScript into new JavaScript and vice versa, it's called transpiling, compiling from JavaScript to JavaScript, something which is complex, but uh, uh, fortunately is hidden from us, from programmers. So basically, there's no much problem about uh, aligning with the versions. But Let's start from uh, JavaScript. As I mentioned, uh, uh, it's uh, the most popular language. So you can fight about Python versus Java versus C Sharp or West, uh, other, other things. But uh, uh, the, the clear winner about the popularity of, uh, of programming language will be JavaScript. So even if uh, everybody hates it, but <laughs> it's there to stay. Hmm? By the way, what you're seeing here rising sharply is TypeScript, which is uh, uh, a version of JavaScript with uh, uh, static typing hmm, that JavaScript doesn't have. So basically, it's built on top of JavaScript. And so it's becoming even stronger. Um, it's a programming language, uh, and uh, it's the only programming language uh, that the browser is able to execute natively. We are reading here. So um, every browser you open will be able, of course, to read HTML pages and style them and so on. But we'll also uh, uh, have an interpreter for the JavaScript language. No other language uh, is uh, understood by the browser. So that is the only choice that we have if we want to build something running on the front end. Uh, it, also, it may also run on the server, thanks to people that some years ago took the, um, the V8 library from Chrome. So. Um, People from Google developing Google Chrome uh, were investing on a JavaScript interpreter they called V8, like you know the V8 cylinders in car in sports cars. Um, that was the engine for running JavaScript, a very efficient one. These people at Node just took out this uh, interpreter from the open source version of Chrome and made an independent product that they called Node.js. So Node embeds in a server environment, in a command line environment, the same. JavaScript engine that is currently inside uh, Google Chrome with some delaying versions, of course. Mm. The name JavaScript has nothing to do with the language Java. So as soon as uh, 
you forget about Java, not just the name, but also the language structure, the better we are, because it's really a, a different, a rational, different foundation. Hmm? Uh, and we have this sentence here that the first version of JavaScript, or the JavaScript interpreter, inside uh, what at the time was called uh, Netscape Navigator version 2. Okay, you probably weren't born yet, or nearly. Um, was written in, in 10 days. Okay? And it shows today. It shows that some design choices that were made uh, for getting something, rushing something together, and the, 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 the initial aim was uh, having a language uh, for building some animation from web pages. Something just for, for aesthetic reason. Um, and so they invented this language, one person <laughs> invented this language and they implemented it in the, in the, in the first browser. And uh, uh, many design choices, oh, that they, they, they really weren't design choices, they were just implementation choices. Uh, still are showing the language that you, you, we would say that there are something strange in the language, huh? some behaviors that we wouldn't expect, we wouldn't lie to have there. And that's because of this, le of this legacy. It was burned like this, and some, for compatibility reasons, we cannot throw away some of the strange behaviors. Some work was, was done uh, in the history of the language where people were recognizing that the language were, were, was growing stronger, and so it needed a, a, um, let's say a, a more solid foundation. So basically, it was uh, uh, invented in 1995. Yeah, definitely one more lap. Uh, and uh, by this by this guy, hmm, which is still around, and uh, asking. Uh, uh, okay, for, for, for its sins, asking uh, uh, to be forgiven. Hmm? <laughs> For, for the for the mistakes, no, there was no mistake. There was really interesting times where uh, browsers were trying to um, innovate over each other. They were different uh, products, uh, and there were very few of them. Okay, but this was in '95. There was some internal uh, improvement on new uh, versions. Uh, basic, ba the basic version in 1995 was not standardized at all. There was one company that built uh, an interpreter for a language they invented into their own browser. That's it. There was another company called Microsoft that saw that it was a good idea and tried to implement into their browser. It was Internet Explorer version 3, a long time ago, a language called JScript, which is a copy, a clone, something like with a little modifications over the JavaScript that was implemented by Netscape. So it, it was the same language, but with different uh, compatibility problems. So they were not totally. And the Microsoft also wanted to capitalize on their own language, Visual Basic. And so they also, in, in Internet Explorer, there was also the interpreter for a language called VBScript, Visual Basic Script. It was a mess. Okay? There was no standard language. Every browser developer went the wrong way, and they were trying to not to be compatible with the others. So that people will use their browsers. And you, you want to play for Microsoft. OK, we want to add new features, but it only works in my browser. So you will stop uh, using the other the competition's browsers. It was the, the browser wars at the time. Um, and it was a nightmare for developers because you never knew what was the behavior of the application you were running. Okay, there are a lot of websites uh, where you say this website is best viewed with Internet Explorer or with uh, Firefox. So there was not really uh, uh, compatibility uh, between the browser. At the same time, in parallel, some people started to try to standardize this language in order to okay to have a reference so that everybody should know at least what was, what was the official version. And it started early, in 1997, and with some iterations. 
uh, well, that were trying to basically to regularize the language to complete it with all the, the, the basic features. Mm -hmm. This was an interesting work which was uh, mostly ignored by the industry. It was a standardization uh, effort done by this uh, company, ECMA, this company is a standardization body which uh, resides in Switzerland, if I remember well. And that created this language called ICMA script, ECMA, because ECMA was the name of the standardization industry. So ECMA script is the official standardized version of JavaScript. As I said, it was basically ignored. And then for 10 years, we didn't have any updates of the language. Well, officially, any standard update. The browsers kept changing things, kept adding information. What we call the Web 2.0 uh, came into uh, existence, so the application could be more interactive, could uh, uh, exchange data in real time with the servers, and so on, thanks to the improvement in the language inside the browsers. And the different browser manufacturers were copying each other, trying to keep feature parity. And uh, the, the market of web application was also growing much bigger. And so developers started to demand more compatibility. There was a lot of time and effort spent in testing the compatibility across the different browsers. And this was against the needs of the industry. So it was good for the browser manufacturers. that were three or four. Okay, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Mozilla. Basically. But it was against all the industry of the web application developers. So that's why there was this strong uh, demand for trying to standardize the modern version of JavaScript. What JavaScript had become after 10 years of, let's say, uncontrolled evolution. Uncontrolled evolution is good for innovation, but it's not good for stability. So in 2009, uh, we, they published the first version called ES5. that tried you know, to uh, put together all the most important innovation in a coherent way, in a consistent way, and they introduced a so-called strict mode. The strict mode for the JavaScript language was a mode, an interpretation mode, where some of the most helpful <laughs> uh, parts of the language were not uh, supported anymore. So it was basically a new language. It was not compatible anymore with the previous version of JavaScript. Of course, you can switch off the strict mode and continue to run into legacy mode, but today nobody wants to do that. Okay, so, so they introduced a discontinuity, saying, okay, we throw away some things that are not really not working well and try to refound the language by using the same syntax, the same basic semantics, into something which is more you know, maintainable. That was, again, a standardization effort that started to be understood and known and integrated into the, the browsers six years later. With this version ES6, uh, where they started to introduce also a uh, more, uh, say, complete uh, object model with classes, uh, uh, modules for being able to split uh, the application into different files and so on, all features that were not there at the beginning of the language. So basically, what we call modern JavaScript is uh, the kind of language that started uh, in this after this long uh, so period of time. And uh, this was starting to be adopted officially by all the browsers. The MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network documentation, will show you for every function, for every method, for every object, uh, when, if the object is supported by the, by, for every object, uh, say in the standard, they will tell you whether it's supported by every browser, from which version it's supported, if it's completed, partially, and so on. And we see that uh, uh, in recent times, all the browsers are supporting the, the, say, the, the, the totality of this version. And every year, there's, there's a new update, of course, that we try to add something, some new feature, some new syntax, uh, or something like that. So a small incremental improvement Oh, improvement. I say changes sometimes they not they don't improve really, but uh, um, and so the, the language is evolving and the browsers are keeping the pace uh, right now into this standardization in 
the initiative there are we have the representative of the browser manufacturer sitting there and also the representative of, of industries sitting there so that the language basically we already know the what the language what to expect from the ne next version of the language because the browser manufacturers are already experimenting with those mm -hmm. so it's a system which is globally being managed mm, in a mm, reasonable way um, of course the naming uh, went uh, went uh, in a random direction because we all we are all talking about javascript officially we should be talking about ecmascript and in particular ex6 or 7 or 8 or something like that but something is also calling it es2015 for ES6 because it went out in, uh, in, uh, in 2015 or JS6 or JS2015, there's a confusion, okay? So uh, I don't care, we call it uh, modern JavaScript. Hmm? Just to understand, uh, um, I, I spent some time in describing the history just for, uh, for us to be more aware when we will see some strange features in the language, uh, where they came from, and so we are grateful that we are in this place where Today we have a good compatibility and a good consistency uh, in the um, in the language. Hmm? Okay. Uh, if you want, uh, you can download the official standard. Uh, probably the 19 version. I don't know if there's a new one. Uh, probably yes. It will be AS11 from 2020. Uh, but uh, you don't want to, to read that. Huh? I tell you, it's just it's a very very formal document which is targeted as uh, implementers of the interpreters, not at the developers. And so we'll tell you all the details for implementing correctly how to, in, how to say, in, interpret the language. So it's not very readable. The real uh, documentation for us programmers is the MDN. Hmm? Uh, JavaScript uh, right now is a standard language and is implemented in different uh, uh, engines. Basically, in the Chrome uh, uh, browser, it's called V8, the engine, the JavaScript interpreter built into Chrome. Uh, Mozilla Foundation has a different uh, uh, engine called the Spider Monkey. And there were also some engines that were used by Microsoft and by uh, Safari, but actually, both Microsoft into the mm, say Edge browser and Apple in Safari are using a so-called WebKit, uh, which is a derivation of, of the V8 uh, from Google. So basically, this engine from Google is being adopted with modifications by Google, of course, by Microsoft into Edge uh, by, and by Safari through a version of which is called WebKit, which was a fork of Chromium, of the Chromium V8 uh, uh, some, some years ago. Hmm? And then there is the, the, the JavaScript interpreter by Mozilla, which is independent. You know, it's separate from that. And it's good that we had at least two independent uh, runtimes uh, to compare. Node.js, of course, is uh, derived from, from the Google V8, as I mentioned. And we see that all these implementations on desktop and on mobile browsers, uh, we see that the different functional some functionalities that we have in the MDN, we have a lot of these tables compatibility tables that list for every feature, which are the minimum versions of the different browsers that are, will sub, are uh, going to support this feature. And if it's red, it means that this browser is not supporting that specific feature. Okay, this is just an old screenshot, so it's not relevant to today, but if we need to check, uh, we have all the information there. Uh, of course, a language that evolves every year it's a problem because we are building applications and we don't want to rewrite or, or correct them every year. We don't have the control over the updating of the application. Because the application is not running on my computer. It's running on everybody else's computer, on their browser. So I have some people who doesn't update their computer since four years or five. And they have some people that are installing the beta or alpha versions uh, every day the nightly version of the browsers. So there will be a very large spread of operating systems, of versions of the, of the type of browsers and the version of these browsers. And all of them will be running the same code I write if I'm the web developer. So compatibility is a very big issue. And uh, 
the de language designers have to be very careful in introducing or in changing language features. Hmm? Uh, what they say is that JavaScript is backwards but not forwards compatible, which means that uh, uh, once something is a, a valid uh, JavaScript, so if you're writing valid JavaScript today, there's a promise that the, the version of JavaScript language that will come out in five or 10 years will still be able to run the code that you're writing today. So new version of JavaScript, people that will update the browser will not break the functionality of your application. Okay? Um, it, the reverse is not true because a new edition of the language may not run into older version of the language. Of the, so if you're writing an application today, it may not run on the browser of some people who maybe updated the browser three years ago. Okay? Um, and basically it will crash or do some strange things. There will be a mechanism for trying to cope with this. So uh, when you're, the, the bundles for what JavaScript application will try to include, uh, when they're running in older browsers, it includes some say, additional code to emulate in the older browsers also the new functionalities. Hmm? But this, of course, of course, will slow everything down. Um, this compatibility is uh, always true. Uh, the strict mode was introduced uh, as a the discontinuity saying, okay, let's start not, not to cross this line, not to support. Uh, we can support everything, but we are strongly suggesting you not to use any of these features. Right? They are still supporting the language, but don't use them. No? So strict mode was a way for the language designers to tell us, okay, don't do that, hmm? uh, even if they are still supported. And there are these mechanisms with strange names, names like transpiling and polyfilling, try to, that are mechanisms for um, taking a version of a, of a or JavaScript program and enabling it to run into a runtime environment that doesn't support all the functionalities. So, um, so a recent version of a JavaScript program that they wrote today in 2022, I can run it in a browser from maybe 2018, 2016. And how? Of course, the browser, the old browser will not recognize all the syntax I'm using today. And so we need to, tra to translate the language into the old, the equivalent language in the old um, standard. And maybe polyfilling, so adding methods or objects that are now are defined in the library, but at the time were not defined yet or had a different behavior. So are replacing that. We are, hopefully, we don't, if we are working, and say, with modern tools, we don't need to care about all of this. So, we are talking about JavaScript. It will run in different places. On the command line, we, on Node, on browsers. And uh, there are also some, uh, say, teaching or learning environment uh, that are online environment like uh, JSTutor or replit.com and so on, when you can play online with some JavaScript code and see it executed uh, for, say, for teaching or learning purposes. Mm -hmm. But of course, our main targets are the server side on Node and the browsers, uh, uh, the different browsers uh, that we are able to run um, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there are the different possibilities. And uh, I mentioned the JavaScript Tutor, which is a very nice platform, and we are going to use it extensively, uh, at least at the beginning, uh, that not only is able to run some JavaScript code, but also to draw and to show in real time the data structures. So when we are going to learn how the strings and arrays and objects are working in JavaScript, we'll use that so that will help us a lot in building a mental model of how the variables work in JavaScript, which is quite peculiar for, for the kind of language. Um, and this online uh, environment, uh, and also in the browsers, we have some uh, embedded uh, debugger uh, in the developer tools or the JavaScript console, where we can test some code or we can debug some code directly into the browser. 
Uh, of course, it will run into the browser environment, which is a bit different from the node environment. So we learn to debug and run the code in both environments. We start with node, with just. Okay. So let's start uh, with the language. Uh, initially, so until we talk about modules, uh, the idea is that one JavaScript program is uh, one big file. Is contained into one big file. If you have a program which is, you, if you want to split a program into different files, maybe because you want to use some libraries also that you didn't write yourself, there are mechanisms for, let's say, having your source code split in different files and putting it all together into the interpreter so that the interpreter will see one different, one, one in single context. So this creates some. This assumption where all the JavaScript is concatenated into one big file and then it's run creates some problems of scoping. Okay. So if you are defining a variable in one file, strange enough, that variable will be visible from a different file so you, if you're not careful, just for this mechanism. Modern version, the strict mode, tries to avoid the problems with that. Um, the execution model of JavaScript is uh, in two steps. The first step is the parsing of the language, and the second step is the execution of the parsed content. Exe by execution, we mean interpretation, usually. This means that the parsing is always com uh, done completely before the execution of the first line. So if you have an, it's an interpreter language, of course, it's not compiled. But if you have a syntax error in, on the last line, the program will not start even from the first one. Okay, so the parsing is done at the beginning and the execution later on. If you are running, if, if, the, the, if a JavaScript program can be started, it means that it doesn't have any syntax error. Okay, which it is good, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there is a standard library that predefines a set of objects that you can use. Uh, there is a standard library defined by the language specification. And then there are extensions of the library in the node environment where node provides you some additional environment, or in the browser environment where the browser provides you, for example, with access to the web page or to the, to the information which is there. So we have a strict, also a strict, a smaller uh, standard library which is predefined by the language designer. And then the extension of this library depending on the execution environment, node or the browser. Uh, JavaScript is uh, a native, uh, a native Unicode language. Okay, so for the encoding of text strings, uh, variable names, and whatever, it's fully Unicode since the beginning. No, not the beginning, beginning, but the, um, the modern versions. Um, and so we have no, we will have no problems uh, in uh, uh, in handling different character sets uh, or whatever. Also. Um, say identifiers could use uh, say accented letters or something like that, but or even emojis or whatever as as variable names. But okay, let's, not, let's try not to do that. Okay, um, this is because uh, the Unicode was chosen as the encoding for the web, so also HTML nowadays should be all encoding Unicode. Okay? So basically, we don't have problems that we have in other languages. Like we had in C or in C plus plus, or we had in Python two, where we also had where we had to explicitly manage the encoding and decoding from to or from Unicode. Yeah, it's all natively Unicode strings. Mm -hmm. um, the language structure, the syntax, looks like C or C plus plus, because we have uh, semicolons for separating uh, statements. But they are not mandatory. If you want, you can put them. If you don't put them, the compiler will uh, introduce them by itself. So they are optional, except mm -hmm. except some cases where they are mandatory, mm -hmm. uh, because the the parser cannot always guess whether you are trying to continue a statement on the next line, uh, or because, for example, in in, in Python, every statement uh, is in a, in a single line, so there is no implicit continuation on the next line. So there's no need for semicolons because when you 
it's the, the new line which terminates the statement. In JavaScript, this is not true. Uh, lines are not significant. So you can write an entire program in just in one line or split every word into a separate line. So the interpretation of language is, is the same. And so the insertion of semicolons cannot rely on new lines, can only rely on the syntax. Of course, if you have a for keyword, for example, in your program, the for is the beginning of a new statement. And so the whatever comes before is the previous statement. Uh, the compiler can insert a semicolon there. There's no ambiguity. Hmm? But if you have, a, an, say, an open parenthesis, this open parenthesis could be the beginning of an expression or could be the parenthesis for a function call in the previous line. And the interpreter doesn't know. So to be conservative, I tend to put semicolons everywhere. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm more sure of what I'm writing. But other people argue that, OK, since they're optional, why do we bother putting them? We will only put them when we know they are needed. Different programming styles, of course. Mm -hmm. um, OK, comments are like in C or C sharp. Uh, and we see that from the syntax point of view, you know, it's very similar to C or, or, or Java, but just from the syntax point of view, don't get, don't get, don't get fooled by similarity. OK, OK, this is the semicolon issue that uh, uh, you find a lot of debates uh, whether to put them or not. Uh, we just know that uh, when they can, when a semicolon can remove without ambiguity, the compiler is able to insert that. If you put it there, it doesn't do any harm. Uh, the strict mode, where we disable some uh, bad uh, syntax or bad semantics, uh, is uh, activated if we uh, put a, a very fake statement at the beginning of the file. If your first line, first executable line of the file, is a string, string use strict semicolon, which is a null statement. No. It's an expression like you, put, you can write three semicolon even in C, in any language. You write an expression, and then it's over. So the, the expression is computed, and the result is, is discarded. Okay? You, you, we don't do it very often because it's useless. But if this beginning, is this string is uh, literally use strict, then the rest of the file will be parsed and interpreted with a strict mode syntax. And we are going to do that always. Okay? For us, it will be uh, the normal way. We see that sometimes we are not, we will not write use strict because the context will imply it. So if we are writing a module, then uh, by definition with strict mode, if you're writing an, an import, uh, so, but details that will come later. Um, okay, we are, I'm not mentioning why, uh, what are the differences with, because we are not going to learn the, the non strict version. Uh, what are the semantics of this language or the, the foundations? Okay, we have a <clears throat> some types, and the first uh, observation is that in JavaScript, uh, every value has a type, but variables don't have a type. If you're familiar with Python, it's the same. A variable is just a, a pure reference. The variable a can ref refer to a string value, to a number value, to an array value, to an object value, in the same variable can change type. The variable doesn't change type. The variable doesn't have a type. Can refer to objects of different types in different moments. So what instead of uh, Java, where when you declare a variable or in C or in C++ or in C sharp, when you declare a variable, you must declare a type for that variable. In JavaScript, like in Python, when you declare a variable, it's just a name. Uh, the value is associated, sorry, the type is associated with the value. So every value, three. Okay, three is a value of type number. ABC, it's a value of type string. And then we can have a variable that will reference that value. Pointers, okay? Things uh, at, uh, don't think like that, but think, uh, think of the JavaScript variables like they were void pointers. 
pointers to values. The pointer itself, the variable itself, doesn't know about the value, but the value itself knows everything about itself. Okay. Of course, if we are sensible people, we will not change the type of the object a variable points to just for fun. We try to be consistent. Okay. So if you are declaring s as a string, we keep using s as a string. If we need uh, an integer, well, let's okay. Let's use another name, please. Let's not reuse the s that was used three lines before the string. If we don't take ourselves. Uh, when we need to write uh, or understand our code. OK, what are the types uh, of the values that are supported? There are some primitive types uh, in JavaScript. Uh, and there are just this handful type. String, number, Boolean. And then there are null and undefined, which are special types. Uh, with only have one value, which are actually null as the null value and undefined as the undefined values. Um, string is a native type. There's no character single char uh, type. It's uh, everything is a string. Okay, string can be written with uh, single quotes, double quotes, or back quotes. Your choice. There is a single number type, uh, which is both for integer and floating point numbers. They are all number internally. They will be converted and they be, will be dealt as integer or as a floating point, but they are not different types. They are all of type number. These are just the predefined types, of course, and there are extra types. Here. Boolean, true and false with the lowercase t and f. Uh, uh, and then, okay, now and defined. And then there is a big container called object types where we have some predefined objects, basically arrays and functions. So it's a bit strange because string is a primitive type, but array is an object type. This means there will be some asymmetries, but OK, we'll uh, learn to handle with those. So an array is a predefined object type in the library. So the behavior of arrays, array is a powerful type here. And uh, that's a lot more than normal arrays. Um, and you can, of course, define your own objects. Next class will be, not, not today, but on Thursday, we'll, be, uh, we'll understand what it means to define an object in JavaScript. Basically, the strange thing is that uh, to create an object, you don't need uh, to define a class like in other languages. You just cre can create an object with the property that you want. It doesn't need to be instantiated from a class. Instantiation doesn't happen in JavaScript. It's strange. For today, let's forget about that. And the other strange thing is that function is not a separate type, but is a object. So functions are objects, like arrays, like uh, user defined objects, and so on. And this gives us some Pretty interesting behavior from functions because functions are objects like any other object in the language. They are not special syntax. Of course, they have a special syntax. But once you define a function, you can work with that function like you could work with an object. So you can modify it. You can pass it around. You can return it from functions. You can duplicate it. You can do operations on an object that by itself is a function. And as a function, it can be called. OK, okay. so this will create, you know, again, some a diff it's not strange, it's not complex, it's just different. Okay, and this, But this uh, uh, strangeness of functions is what gives uh, to JavaScript its uh, power, expressive power, and the way of programming it comes just from that. Uh, we say that Boolean is a type with only two values, true and false. Yes, the Boolean type. But uh, then we have Boolean expressions. So when you're writing an if statement, uh, we, need, we need an expression that will evaluate to true or false. Instead of other languages, you know, in Java, you must have uh, an expression that evaluates to Boolean. If uh, x is an integer, you cannot write if x. 
in C you could do that, and the understanding was if x is different is different by zero, then it's considered true. Okay. So in JavaScript, there's a mechanism that uh, uh, tries to interpret any value as a truthy or falsy value. So truth is something like true or something like false. Hmm? So they are actually using these words, truthy and falsy, and uh, all the fall, all this value, zero, not a number, which is a number. It's a, an instance of a number that, you, that, comes, that comes out when you have some parsing errors, because it's, a, it's an instance of the, of the type number. Undefined, now at the empty string are false. As, are considered as false values whenever they happen. And you need to, uh, say to, to pass a Boolean, to compute a Boolean value. Every other value is uh, false. Sorry, is true. Every other value is true. A string, an empty array, an empty object, a number different by zero is considered as true. Right. Okay, there's a slight asymmetry here already because an empty array is true and an empty string is false. And this Create some interesting bugs and when you when we forget about that. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, for creating Boolean values, uh, of course, uh, the, ma the major uh, um, same operator is the comparison operator. But there is a, a special form of the comparison operator with three equals. Okay. What does it mean? Is that JavaScript is always very uh, forgiving about uh, type mismatches. If you are writing an expression with different types in your variables, so you are trying to add an, an integer with a floating point, this is it. You will convert the integer to floating point and then do the addition. If you try to convert to, uh, let's, let's try that. Let's use the, uh, Directly in the console, node is an, also an interactive uh, interpreter, so we can write instruction there and write and uh, see the result. So, of course, if I write right, 3 plus 2 is 5. And 3 plus 2.1 would be, okay, 5.1. This is a normal promotion of uh, numerical types. Uh, if you write uh, 3 A, plus b as strings, it will give me a b as a string. If I try to do a plus 3 as a number, we would expect an error. You cannot, in all the other languages, it will be an error. You cannot sum string with the number. And JavaScript is not an error because it will first try to convert the number to a string and then apply the plus, which is a concatenation operator on strings. So before doing an operation, JavaScript will always try to promote the types uh, to a common level where they, it can do the operation. Also in comparison, so if you ask uh, JavaScript is if a is equal to b, of course it would be false. If uh, 3 is equal to 4, it would be false. And the, of course, if 3 is equal to 3, I expect it to be true. But what is strange is that also 3 as a string is equal to 3 as, an in, as a number. Because the, the same rule applies as we were doing with the plus operator. Types are different. Let's promote them to a common type and then do the comparison. Especially when we are doing comparisons, this is something that we don't like. Okay. In doing operations, maybe it's uh, something which is convenient for us, but in comparison, no. So they introduced a new triple equal op uh, operator, which is compare the two expressions without promoting types. So we are just suppressing the automatic type promotion 
for this specific operator. So the suggestion normally is to learn to use by habit always the triple equal. Unless we want, uh, because we, can, we, we may want it, it's not forbidden, we want a uh, type uh, uh, promotion and then we use the double equal. Okay, so just as a habit, let's try not to use the double e equal, but only a triple equal, so it's more pretty. It's not a different uh, operator, it's just uh, in this implementation, the promotion step is disabled. There is no way to disable that for uh, uh, any other operator, so it will always happen. Um, okay. There are these special values. Um, now, an undefined and not a number are three different uh, values of three different types. Null is a value of type null. Sorry, is that. Undefined is a variable of type undefined. So, by defining is both the name, the name of the type, and also the value. Hmm? Like we had, I, I could say, true is a value of type boolean. Okay. In this case, undefined is a value of type undefined. Not a number is a value of type number. Okay. So it would be usually numerical expression and comes out when you are maybe parsing a string uh, into a number and the string actually doesn't contain a number. And so the result would be none or we are dividing by zero or something like that. So the result of an, an operation should be a, a number type, but it's not, it's not a valid number. Hmm? Um, undefined is a very common uh, value that we find, uh, for example, when we forget to pass a parameter to a function. So there should be a, a parameter to a function call, and we, we don't pass the parameter. The parameter itself uh, will have will assume the value undefined. When the a function doesn't return any value with a return expression, it will actually return the uh, undefined value, and so on. When you are looking something from a data structure and uh, the value isn't there, the JavaScript language returns uh, undefined. So in many times, in many occasions, when other languages would, would throw an exception, because a value is missing, JavaScript would, in fact, uh, return this undefined value. So the program will continue to run. Of course, it will uh, be your responsibility to check the result and not the language responsibility to throw an exception. This comes from the mentality that uh, an application in a web browser doesn't have a user to, to, or developer to, to debug it or even to catch the error message. So let's try not to stop it. It's like the show, it must go on, the application must go on. It must not stop because there's some syntax error. Okay, the interpreter will continue, will return garbage values, but at least will not stop the web page from, from doing something. Uh, the null value is not useful as in other languages, not used uh, very often, basically, because we don't have those class and object duality like we have in other languages. Okay, so... Um, I will just introduce this, and then, since uh, it's a bit of, of a com uh, it's more complex than, uh, than we would like, uh, we'll, we'll continue that after the break. Um, like we said, variables are pure references. This means that a variable doesn't have a type. Okay? So assigning to a variable an, an in a value of type integer, and later on assigning to the same variable a, a, type, a value of type string, it's perfectly legal. The value doesn't know, doesn't have a type, but every time you use the, the, this variable, it will pick the value that is currently referring to, and then you can reason about the type of the value. Just, uh, we just, I, I keep repeating it because we want to e erase the idea that variables have types. No, values have types. Um, and there are uh, different ways of declaring variables. Before the strict mode, uh, declaring variable was option, optional. You could just assign a value and the variable was created on the spot. You can imagine. Um, in strict mode, uh, variable assignment, uh, variable declaration is mandatory. So every variable must be declared 
I was trying to say the first time you are using it, but it's not true. Uh, there, there's an exception. That's why the complexity counts. But uh, the variable must be declared to use it. Normally, you declare it the first time you use it, but there's an exception. And there are three different ways of declaring a variable. Let, const, and var. Let and const are, let's say, the modern ways. Normal ways, the more sensible ways of using variables. Var is an older type of declaration that comes from the previous version of JavaScript, which is still supported today. It's not forbidden. Even in strict mode, it, it works, but it works a bit differently in the scoping of the declaration. Okay, when we declare a variable with let on const, the scope will be the block in which it is declared. When we declare a variable with var, the scope will be the whole function in which the declaration appears, which is a strength thing. We need some time to, uh, to, to understand the difference. So what I propose is doing a break here now and uh, meet again in uh, 15 minutes, 10.30, or 35, let's say. Right?